Welcome to Longevity by Design. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Longevity by Design. I'm Ashley Reaver, and we are joined by Dr. Gail Blander. This episode is brought to you by Inside Tracker, a company that creates evidence based health solutions that are simple, clear, and actionable. Today, our guest is Dr. David Katz. Dr. Katz is the founding director of Yale University's Yale Griffin Prevention Research Center, a CDC-funded clinical research lab he has run for 20 years. He has secured and managed over $40 million in total research funding, primarily from the CDC, as well as the NIH and other federal agencies, nonprofit foundations, and industry. He has seen he has overseen dozens of community and clinical intervention trials and generated roughly 200 peer-reviewed publications. Very busy man. David is also an advisor on the advisory board of InstaTracker. We met a few years ago at a, an event at the Friedman School of Nutrition at Tuff University. David gave an amazing seminar. And after the seminar, I came to David and I said, David, you, you have to join our scientific advisory board. Uh, but apparently at that time, David was too busy and he said, okay, let's, uh, let's try to talk. Uh, as a, a good founder, I was aggressive enough. And uh, a few years later, when he came again to the same event, I came to him again and say, hey, David, uh, I know that you're busy, but you really need to listen to me. And uh, then uh, I convinced David to meet and I showed him uh, a presentation on Finster Tracker. And luckily, David joined us, and uh, it's a great pleasure, uh, David, to have you together with us today and discuss uh, longevity and uh, uh, public health. Thank you for coming. Likewise, Gil. Great to be with you. And Ashley, thanks for the kind words of intro. That, that, that bio is, uh, I think, a little outdated at this point. So I, you know, I managed the Prevention Research Center for 21 years and left, and uh, I'm now running my own company in addition to advising uh, Inside Tracker, which is a, a, an honor. Um, and yeah, Gil, you know, I, I obviously, once I heard the details of what you're doing, I was blown away. And I really just wanted a seat at the table or to be a fly on the wall so, you know, I, I could look on. I mean, the, the, the unique approach here of measuring so many aspects of health and then combining that with machine learning, I, you know, I, I think there's a tremendous opportunity to advance the goals of human longevity. and in a sense, what really matters more, vitality. In one of my columns, Gil, I, I coined the term, and nobody else is using it yet. Maybe, maybe my mother, maybe I can't even talk her into it, I don't know. But, but vigevity, which essentially, you know, I, I talk all the time about years in life, life in years. That would be the combination of the two, right? A bounty of years in life, that's good. Really what tends to be lacking in modern society is not a, a long life. Uh, you know, With modern medicine, we're generally pretty good at protecting that. But it's it's the quality of that life. It's it's you know those those years infused with vitality and pursuing the combination is really a laudable goal. So so I salute you for all the great work that you're doing at Inside Tracker. That's a good segue into kind of our our first question before we dive into into the research. Just learning a little bit more about you, um, where you live, and what your work looks like now. Tell us about that new company. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Ashley. So, so again, I, I was at Yale in one capacity or another for about 30 years. Uh, I did a lot of teaching, uh, did patient care. Initially, I uh, was seeing patients at Yale New Haven Hospital, transitioned to a Yale-affiliated community hospital in 1996, Griffin Hospital in Derby, Connecticut, wound up establishing the Prevention Research Center there. I, I trained in internal medicine, finished my training in 1991, and then preventive medicine public health and completed that in 1993. And ever since, my career has been devoted to what I just described, adding years to lives, adding life to years, preventing chronic diseases, cardiometabolic disease and obesity in particular, promoting health. And then, you know, Ashley, I, I think I make the case every chance I get that you really can't call yourself a health professional in 2021 if you don't advocate frequently and fervently for the health of the planet. There are no healthy people on a ruined, inhospitable planet. So you know, for the better part of the last decade and a half, I, I've extended my mantra from add years to lives, add life to years, to include and save the planet. <laughs> because you know, <laughs> we, we can't promote human health at the expense of our one and only home. So and I've tried to do those things every which way I can. And the, the reason that I left academia 
to run my own companies. I, I, I had an epiphany one day while working out. Uh, and I'd been frustrated in, in many aspects of my work with the fact that we manage what we measure and we do not measure diet quality. Uh, you know, everybody knows their blood pressure and most people know their heart rate and most people even know their BMI or at least their weight, but nobody knows the objective measure of their diet quality. It's almost never measured. It's, it's a rounding error of the population. And yet diet is the single leading predictor variable for all cause mortality in, in the modern world. So that was really frustrating. And the reason we don't measure it routinely mostly is we had no good tools to do that. Uh, we can get a lot of great information about cardiometabolic health and risk and of course inside trackers on the cutting edge of all that. But a simple way to capture a comprehensive view of dietary intake simply didn't exist. So I, my epiphany was a whole new way to do that. And it, you know, I, I then ran, I'm, I'm privileged to call a who's who in nutrition and public health, close friends and colleagues. So, you know, I, I wanted a reality check. I took it to the chair of nutrition at Harvard at the time, Walter Willett, Frank Hugh. I mean, they're, they're good friends of mine. I said, guys, what do you think? And I was expecting to say, no, it's stupid. <laughs> but they said, no, I, you know, actually, I think there's a there there. And anyway, the next thing you know, I'm running a company. So it's called Diet ID. And we're on a mission to make diet a vital sign. The, the other thing that I, I devote a lot of time, energy, and passion to these days is the True Health Initiative. And uh, Gil, of course, you're familiar with that. Uh, this is a nonprofit I founded when I was president of the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. We, so I, I mentioned the timeline of my career, kind of you know, where I began. So you know, I was sort of freshly minted preventive medicine specialist in 1993, and a paper came out in the Journal of the American Medical Association that year, so almost 30 years ago, entitled Actual Causes of Death in the United States. Now, it might as well have been actual causes of death in modern countries all around the world because our epidemiology is much the same. But what was so compelling about it is the two authors who are preeminent epidemiologists to this day, Mike McGinnis, uh, who's at the National Academy of Medicine, and, and Bill Fagey, uh, who's now retired, um, they looked past the things that get listed on death certificates to ask questions about the causes of that. What are the causes of the causes of death in the hospital, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, atherosclerotic heart disease is the cause of the heart attack. That's the cause of heart failure. That's the cause of death. But what caused the atherosclerosis? So they answered those questions, and you know the root causes, and and overwhelmingly that was stuff we could fix. And and in fact, eighty percent of the answer was just three things: tobacco, poor diet, lack of physical activity, bad use of feet, forks, and fingers. Right? <laughs> eighty percent of premature death and and chronic disease. I've been eager my entire career to turn that knowledge into routine action. And you know, one of the things we have to do is make sure that that knowledge is common knowledge. Uh, so the True Health Initiative is a communication hub. We, we have a council of directors that's about 500 world leading experts from 46 countries. And the whole purpose is to have them stand up in public, link arms and sing Kumbaya. I mean, basically the idea, we agree. We agree that people should eat a plant predominant diet. We agree that the fundamentals of a health promoting lifestyle are not an enigma. We agree that the public deserves to know that. We agree that you know the, the public should not get a whole new way of eating on a morning show, you know, every other week and all that. So we're 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 working to make the fundamental understanding of what what really matters about lifestyle as medicine, common knowledge at the confluence of science, sense, and global expert consensus. I do other things too. I've written a bunch of books and you know, I, I stay busy, but, but those are really the things that I've been preferentially focused on recently, running Diet ID and advancing the mission of the True Health Initiative. So, so David, a, 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 a quick transition. Um, question about why, why have you decided to be a physician and when have you came to the epiphany that you want to be a physician? Can you tell us that? <laughs> I, I blame that on a, on a distinct lack of creativity on my part, Gil. I, and, and honestly, if I had it all to do over again, you know, given what I mentioned about the planet, uh, I, I really like this planet. Uh, and I'd, I'd really like there to be an Amazon rainforest and a rainforest in Borneo. And I kind of like ice at the polar caps and I like polar bears and, you know, all that. So I might have gone into engineering and, and devoted myself entirely to a save the planet mission if I had it to do over again. But 
you know, growing up, I, I was a good student, obviously, as a kid. That sort of takes on a certain momentum, right? You're, you're good at schools, kind of get in that track, and you take AP courses, and it, it just sort of leads you in the direction of, okay, now what do I do? More school, the pinnacle of all that is get some kind of a doctoral degree. But I, I really, um, I think I've got a native inclination to run toward the burning building. You know, I think that's just kind of in you or it's not. I mean, I, I see broken stuff. I want to fix it. I really do. I mean, I just, I'm drawn to it. And, and I, I, I literally, you know, those times I've seen a crisis, I'm pulled toward it, not away. You know, it doesn't activate fear. It, it activates some compulsion to intervene and fix what's broken. And it, it always has. My dad's a cardiologist, you know, so I watched that growing up. And I thought about law uh, because I have the gift of gab. Uh, without having kissed the Blarney Stone. I, I still look forward to my first trip to Ireland. My son kissed the Blarney Stone. Maybe I got it by proxy. Uh, <laughs> I thought about veterinary medicine. I love critters. Um, several of my best friends on the planet have four legs apiece. So I, you know, I thought about that. But wound up choosing the path of least resistance. And, you know, there was sort of a joke. When, when I was a kid, um, the expression used to refer to the expanse of opportunities was doctor, lawyer, Indian chief. I have no idea why, but I lacked the bloodline for Indian chief. So I was down to only two choices. <laughs> <laughs> so I picked medicine. And then, you know, so I went to medical school without a particularly clear notion of, you know, where it was going to take me. And that, that's when I had uh, an aha moment. So I, I, was, I, did, I went to medical school, was still not sure exactly what I wanted to do, decided on internal medicine, partly because it's, it's the greatest breadth of medical training, post-medical school. So three years of residency. But during your residency in internal medicine, you're in the hospital 110 hours a week. You know, I mean, it, it's torture. It's intense education. And, you, you know, mostly what you're trying to do is not let people die on your watch, to be honest. I mean, everybody in the hospital is pretty sick. And, you know, if they die on your watch, you know, it's a blight on your record. <laughs> if you get them through to the next watch, you get to tick the box and say, okay, I did my job today. Um, and, and that's enough, really, because it's hard. I mean, you know, it's every condition under the sun. And, you know, you're treating cancers and infectious diseases and multi-organ system failure and taking care of patients in the ICU and all of that. Um, but I'm a, you know, in the same way that I'm sort of drawn toward the, the burning building, I'm also drawn toward the big picture. You know, in academia, I've met a lot of really smart people who are tree experts who maybe don't tend to see the forest. Yeah, <laughs> I've seen them. <laughs> yeah, you, you know what I mean, uh, you know. And, and at the extreme, it's almost, you know, the idiot savant who's incredibly knowledgeable in this very narrow lane, yeah. but just can't see anything outside the lane. I'm the opposite. And I, I sort of struggled in academia for that reason. I'm a big picture guy. You know, I really, I care about what matters in the real world. I, you know, the ivory tower stuff doesn't interest me all that much. And so in my medical training, I was overwhelmed by the fact that easily eight out of 10 people in those hospital beds had stuff they never needed to get. I mean, that just kept gnawing at me. And so two thirds of the way through my training in internal medicine, I said, this is not enough. I, I do want to take care of sick people and help in moments of acute need, but I need to do something about preventing the next cohort of people from winding up in the same situation. Because essentially, if, if you step back and look from altitude at training in internal medicine, you are being trained to be one of the king's horses and one of the king's men, right? Which famously could not put Humpty Dumpty back together again. And essentially, we could never put complete vitality back together again either. We could patch people up. We could forestall death. And sometimes we could do better than that. But we were never building vitality at its origins. We were never putting complete vitality back together. We were never unscrambling an egg. And I said, well, I want to be involved in you know, engineering uh, you know, some sort of safe landing at the base of the wall or putting a seatbelt up there. You know, there's no reason for Humpty to fall off there and crack open in the first place. I don't want to be one of the king's horses, one of the king's men. We can do better. So I went into preventive medicine and, and that changed everything because, you know, I continued to do internal medicine, see patients, all that. But preferentially, my career was focused on let's prevent all this preventable misery and mayhem in the first place. Yeah, and something very uh, uh, interesting that happened recently when COVID came, uh, I heard that you decided to uh, go into the hospital even so that you are not uh, uh, actively practicing medicine right now and uh, basically help uh, help the society to pass this wave. So I, I really salute you to, of doing that. That's, that's really noble. 
Oh, thank you, Gil. You know, I mean, th this was a situation, this was during the surge in New York. So this was over a year ago. And, um, you know, I mean, I, I know a lot of these people. I mean, some of them are colleagues, some of them are former students, you know, I mean, in, in hospitals all around this area, I, I know a lot of that community. And so it was an easy call, except for dealing with my family, because this was in the early going of the yeah. pandemic. Everybody was scared. Um, you know, and now I, people are, are exhausted. And, and obviously, there are places where the, the pandemic's terrible. India is, is having a, a horrible surge as we record this. Um, but, you know, it's like in a horror movie where the most terrifying part of the movie is before the, the monster is revealed. And then however bad the monster is, once revealed, we're a little less scared because we know what we're dealing with. Yeah. The pandemic was like that. So a year ago, or even a little over a year ago, um, people were really terrified. And so, you know, when I told my wife, I, I've got to do this. So I, I you know, I, I'm still a, a licensed physician in Connecticut. And um, I had requests both through New York um, government, New York state government, and through my alma mater, I went to medical school in the Bronx. So my my medical school issued a call for alums if they could volunteer and, um, and help with the search. It was not a difficult decision to make, um, but dealing with my family was. So my wife cried and argued, and my mother cried and argued, <laughs> and my kids argued, and and, uh, you know, because at the time, everybody really was worried. I mean, that going to the front lines might mean you get this and you die. And I said, you know, I don't think so. Because you, know, you, as you know, Gil, I was writing about the pandemic from very early on. And one of the things that I emphasized was it's very clear before ever SARS-CoV-2 got to the U.S. Or, or Israel, you know, when we were we just had data from two places, really, Wuhan, China and South Korea. And yet it was already clear this is not a one size fits all threat. It, it's likely to be a very bad disease if you're very elderly or in bad health or both. And it's likely to be a quite mild disease. And, and of course, we know a lot more about what that means now and long COVID and all that. We can get into that. But, but it's, it's likely to be a quite mild disease if you are young, healthy or both. I don't know that I still qualify as young at 58, but, you know, I'm unusually healthy because I'm a preventive medicine specialist. And I said, I, you know, I don't, I'm, I'll take precautions. I'll wear an N95 mask and did. And by the way, you know, so I was doing 12 hour shifts in the emergency room in the Bronx, wearing an N95 mask for 12 hours. I, I, you know, I, I don't know which is worse. I've had COVID. <laughs> I don't know which is worse. <laughs> COVID or wearing the damn mask 12 hours. That was horrible. <laughs> but, you know, I didn't get it then. Um, but I, you know, I reassured my family, I, I'm not going to get it. We'll be very careful. But if I do get it, I, I, I'm quite confident I'll be fine. But it, you know, that was the hard part was talking my family into it. So a discussion on COVID is kind of a nice segue into, well, I would say a very extreme example of how lifestyle choices really can impact your risk of disease or severity of disease. Um, you know, since that's also really your expertise, can you talk us through a little bit about how lifestyle choices in particular dietary choices really do have significant impacts on longevity, mortality, whatever it may be? Yeah, Ashley, I, I've sort of become more notorious during the pandemic than I ever intended, um, uh, partly because I, I penned an op-ed that ran in the New York Times very early on raising the issue of total heart minimization and uh, you know basically pointing out uh, that that locking down society is not free of cost and it, it's fine as as a short-term measure but you've got to have a next step what do you do next and so i i really argued for a couple of things uh the first was the goal should be total harm minimization that means preventing the the, the harms of infection by SARS-CoV-2 but also preventing the harms of unemployment and destitution desperation depression addiction suicide you know all the bad stuff that happens when when lives are upended and the way to manage total risk to everybody was to risk stratify who's at risk for what you know essentially the, the only way you can fix anything is to know where it's likely to break or already broken. And, and some people were clearly very vulnerable to the virus, but other people were more likely to be harmed in other ways. And, and so this, this was a, a big part of my platform during the pandemic. And, you know, I wound up doing media interviews all over the place. I was on Bill Maher's show and CNN, and I even wound up on Fox News and, and just on and on it went. I testified actually before the Senate Homeland Security Committee spoke to a couple of governors who called me. 
And um, the other thing that I, I started to champion from very early on was we already were in a pandemic. We were already in a pandemic bigger than SARS-CoV-2. Now, you know, when the, the United States, of course, has done a horrendous job managing the pandemic, and we've had a horrible casualty toll. When we crossed the threshold of over 500,000 lives lost, it was a mournful moment. And it was rightly acknowledged as such, you know, basically the, the nation bowed its head. Uh, and, and, you know, again, right, we were to do so. But poor diet quality all by itself kills 500,000 people prematurely in the United States every year. There was an op-ed in the New York Times, August 26th of 2019, entitled, Our Food is Killing Too Many of Us. The authors were Darius Mozafarian, Dean of Nutrition at Tufts, and Dan Glickman, former Secretary of Agriculture of the United States. And in that op-ed, they cite the primary literature that makes the case that diet now is the single leading predictor variable for all-cause mortality. The travesty there, Ashley, is that, of course, SARS-CoV-2 got loose, and then we were no longer in charge. We, we could protect ourselves, but we don't control what the virus does. But food, we make it. We produce it. We distribute. We're totally in control. If food is killing people, then we are killing one another with food for the sake of profit. I mean, it really is a travesty. But it's, it's this massive pandemic that hides in plain sight. And, of course, it reverberates out. Food is the centerpiece. But, you know, as I mentioned earlier, the, the three master levers of medical destiny are feet, physical activity, forks, dietary patterns, and fingers, exposure to toxins like tobacco, excess alcohol, you know, all, all the bad things we, we bring to our, <laughs> our faces. Um, if we just avoided tobacco systematically, ate optimally, and were physically active, 80% of all chronic disease in the modern world would go away and 80% of the premature death. One of the, the problems with a statement like that is I make that statement, you may nod your head, Ashley, but you, you know it didn't bring a tear to your eye. And it, and it really should, because public health is a delusion. The public doesn't exist. There is no public. The public's a fiction. They're, they're just real people like you and me and Gil and our families. You know, everybody is real. The public is just basically the view from altitude of people when you're too far away to identify the individuals. But it's amazing. You know, if you talk about an individual who doesn't get cancer and it's somebody you love, it does bring a tear to your eye. You talk about 80% less cancer in the world and people nod their head, okay, that would be nice. No, no, it's not just nice. It's transformational. All of us have met the enemy. All of our families have been invaded by heart disease, cancer, stroke, diabetes, dementia, one of those, all of those, some of those. 80% of all of that is preventable, which means eight times in 10, those personal tragedies affecting our inner circles need not have happened. And the remedy is lifestyle is medicine. We know this from a bounty of literature. We know it from the McGinnis and Fagy paper in 1993, Actual Causes of Death. There was a great paper by Earl Ford and colleagues in the Annals of Internal Medicine in 2009, Healthy Living is the Best Revenge, showed that people who didn't smoke, ate well, were physically active, had a healthy weight, developed 80% less chronic disease over a span of years than people who did smoke, ate badly, didn't exercise, had an unhealthy weight. There's been study after study after study. The Diabetes Prevention Program, $174 million clinical trial, randomly assigned people with prediabetes to usual care. The best drug we had at the time, metformin, or a lifestyle intervention. The drug was pretty good. It prevented the development of diabetes 30% of the time in high-risk people. Lifestyle was twice as good as the best drug we had. 58% of the time, it prevented diabetes in high-risk people. It goes on and on and on. Lifestyle is the best medicine we have. We just have to get that medicine to go down. And Lord knows the last thing we need is more spoons full of sugar. But we really need the big spoon of culture to better administer lifestyle as medicine. And I think at the leading edge of that is, is innovation that makes people aware and empowered. Uh, you know, again, I, I, I'm really privileged to, to be able to look on at the work that Inside Tracker is doing. Because you know, when, when you can take a large body of information about what's possible, what, what your health risks are, what you can do to manage those, and, and you know, make that actionable for people, it's transformational. We can help the entire population eliminate 80% of premature death and chronic disease, but it really begins at the end of one level by helping an individual reduce his or her personal risk of all that bad stuff 
by 80%. I mean, you know, it, it's incredible. I, I'll, I'll, I'll close this long answer, Ashley, by, by noting the following. Imagine if there were a new drug. We, we heard an announcement, a press release. It's, you know, all the, the media are picking it up. The FDA has just announced they've approved a new drug. It uh, is incredibly inexpensive. It's available in bountiful supply. Everybody can have it if they want it. Uh, it so far is not just stunningly free of side effects in everybody who takes it, but for the most part, it actually does good stuff it wasn't even intended to do. So it, it'll, you know, it'll fix the broken stuff. And oh, by the way, the added benefit, you'll actually have more energy too and sleep better too. Uh, and if you take this pill, this newly uh, approved pill, once a day, and by the way, it's safe enough for children and octogenarians alike. Everybody can take it. Take it once daily for the rest of your life. Your risk of ever developing heart disease, cancer, stroke, diabetes, dementia, and so on will go down 80%. I mean, who wouldn't want this prescription? Doctor's offices would be totally overwhelmed. You know, lines would be out the door. Uh, there is no such pill. And in my professional opinion, <laughs> no, I don't think there'll ever yes. be such a pill. But but lifestyle is that medicine. I don't think we're going to put lifestyle on the pill. I mean, you know, there are pills that that make up some of the deficit and can help, and supplements that can help, and all that. But no, no, it'll ne we'll never encapsulate lifestyle. Lifestyle can do all of that, and it is accessible to everyone. Yeah. So, so David, the follow up question about that. Uh, and the, uh, the subject of uh, this mm. podcast is longevity by design. So I would like to know from you or uh, ask you about how, what is the effect of lifestyle uh, on longevity? And uh, can you quantify it and say someone that uh, uh, doesn't follow a good uh, lifestyle versus someone that is following a good life lifestyle? What uh, should be the difference in the lifespan? You know, or health span one of, of the uh, answers I like best is, is courtesy of pop culture. I, I forget actually who was running the ad, if it was a health system or an insurance company or if it was a PSA. But basically it starts with a, a, a gentleman in, you know, at or about middle age. And then it, it just shows that it, it, in sort of fast action over the span of 30 or 60 seconds, the span of his life, if he goes down the path of living well versus not living well. And, you know, it, it's normal in our culture to deteriorate as you age and develop a, a you know, a burden of comorbidity and be the beneficiary or victim of polypharmacy and have, you know, basically you wind up on so many drugs that you need to take drugs to treat the side effects of some of the drugs you're taking. And so, you know, one, one view of this man's life trajectory showed that and the other showed, you know, he was living well and vital and playing with his grandkids and maybe his great grandkids. So, I mean, it, it is that vivid. It, it is, you know, two roads diverged in a yellow wood and in our culture, the road to vitality is the road less traveled for sure. And we need to change that. But, you know, to answer your question, Gil, about how profound it is, and of course, you know, you're familiar with this, that your, your work is dedicated to this same value proposition, but we might start with the world's blue zones. So this is the, the, the work of National Geographic fellow Dan Buettner and his team. Uh, you know, Dan traveled to these places and found the highest concentrations of centenarians anywhere in the world. So the, the, the world's five blue zones in Ikaria, Greece, Sardinia, Italy, Okinawa, Japan, Loma Linda, California, and the Nicoya Peninsula in Costa Rica have the highest concentrations of 100-year-old people any place on the planet. And in addition, these people don't just, you know, they don't crawl their way to 100. They're hoeing fields and felling trees. You know, they're vital. They don't get chronic disease. They don't get dementia. Their cognition's intact. And, you know, they don't have some, you know, advanced scientific program. Uh, they're not taking any particular pill. Lifestyle is their medicine. They tend to eat optimal diets, all plant predominant, real food. They don't eat glow in the dark Franken food. They're not drinking soda. They're physically active and not because of, you know, gym membership, which is fine, but just because it's normal to be outside walking and working and gardening. And they don't tend to smoke uh, or they smoke at a very low level. Um, they get plenty of sleep, uh, which, you know, we're, we're all insomniacs in the modern world, but the blue zones are not, they're not stressed out, uh, because, you know, they're doing all these other things that alleviate stress and they have very strong social connection, strong sense of community. Uh, I call it feet, forks, fingers, sleep, stress, and love. Dan, Dan calls it uh, by other names, but it, you know, either way you get a six cylinder engine of lifestyles medicine. So, you know, we, we know when you sort of step back and look at populations, 
that that's possible. That that you know, I, and and what's particularly vivid about this gill is that these five, five populations have lifestyle in common, but they do not have genes in common. I mean, they're, they're, it's a very diverse cross section of humanity. So there's a lot of genetic variability in the mix. So this is not genetics. This is not genomics. Th this is lifestyle. Uh, the power of lifestyle, sort of regardless of what your your baseline risks are. So we have that body of evidence, and I, I find that very compelling. The other thing we have is a look inside the cell. And, you know, we can talk about mitochondrial regeneration and mitophagy and, you know, there are all sorts of intricate pathways. Some of this stuff I'm sure you know better than I do. But I particularly like looking at the architecture of our chromosomes and talking about telomeres. Uh, you know, the, the fact that the length of telomeres, the caps at the ends of our chromosomes, correlates with healthy lifespan earned Elizabeth Blackburn at UCSF a uh, Nobel Prize in Medicine. She collaborated with, and, and by the way, um, Professor Blackburn, along with Alyssa Pell, a uh, former grad student at Yale when I was doing my preventive medicine training, so I've known Alyssa for many years. She's now also at uh, UCSF. Uh, professors Blackburn and Appel wrote a book together, The Telomere Effect. Uh, I commend that to people. What's nice about The Telomere Effect is it reaches all the same conclusions that have populated all of my books, you know, about what healthy living looks like. Uh, but they're looking at this through the lens of what's going on, not just intracellularly, but in the architecture of our chromosomes. I mean, you can't get more intimate than that. And they, they, they've actually described the research, and my friend Dean Ornish was involved with this research too, showing lifestyle interventions can lengthen telomeres. So, you know, in other words, eating well, being active, avoiding toxins, getting enough sleep, managing stress, cultivating social connections, that formula, your telomeres get longer. And long telomeres are just about the most potent predictor in biology of long, healthy life, other things being equal. I, I'm always quick to point out that you can have long telomeres and standing in front of a moving train is still a really bad idea. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's not quite a Important guarantee. to caveat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, important proviso. I mean, it does not make you bulletproof. But, but other things being equal, long telomeres, long, healthy life. And, you know, every time it's the same formula. So the what that will get us there is not a mystery, not at all how to get people to take advantage of that is the trick. And, you know, I, I'm wrestling with it. You're wrestling with it. Um, you know, that's really the next great frontier. How do, how do we make what we know can add both years to lives and life to years available and accessible and actionable to everybody? And how long we wind up living, you know, is it 100 routinely? Can we push it out to 120? You know, uh, time will tell. But for now, the idea that we could routinely have a 100-year lifespan and, and not just you know, barely make it, but literally be vital until, and, you know, so in the blue zones, what's fairly common, you know, I, I'm a Star Trek fan, so they live long, they prosper with vitality. <laughs> I'm also a, a poetry fan, so Dylan Thomas, they go gentle into that good night. You know, in the fullness of time, they go to sleep one night at age 102 and just don't wake up. They don't die in ICU. So, I mean, everything about that is so yeah. beautiful. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, sign me up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, 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 David, that's very encouraging that uh, what you said so far that uh, basically lifestyle can do a lot for longevity and also for uh, um, basically the quality of life when you are older, and that's uh, super important. Uh, I'm trying to go a bit deeper uh, because we know that lifestyle, as you said, is not only nutrition. There are other uh, effects of lifestyle. And the question, if you can just focus on nutrition for a second. And tell us what what is, in your opinion, the sure. impact sure. of nutrition and I, and and longevity. I, I could pick any one of several books sitting next to me. We, we're just wrapping up the fourth edition uh, of Nutrition and Clinical Practice. That's my textbook. I, I wrote the first edition 20-some-odd years ago. Obviously, it's fared reasonably well before a jury of peers, so we just did the fourth edition. I just turned in the last chapter. But but this is one of my books, um, The Truth About Food. <laughs> 700, it's 750 <laughs> pages. If you ever need a book to hold the door open in a stiff wind, <laughs> this is your book. I'm your guy. Uh, this is everything I know and, and how I know it. And by the way, all proceeds from, from this book go to the True Health Initiative. And, and it, what's interesting about nice. it is, so the book is called The Truth About Food, Why Pandas Eat Bamboo and People Get Bamboozled. And... <laughs> And, and the truth about food could have been a seven word book. And the, the seven words wouldn't even have been mine. They would have been Michael Pollan's eat food, not too much, mostly plants. You know, it's like dietary haiku. We're done. Thank you. <laughs> I mean, that's it. And, and then you can embellish that. 
okay, you know, what do we mean? We mean real food, not processed food, food direct from nature. And mostly plants means lots of vegetables, fruits, whole grains, beans, lentils, nuts, and seeds. And by the way, when you're thirsty, you should drink plain water most of the time. And if you really do mostly that, whatever else you do is probably not going to matter too much. It'll be fine. And if you don't do mostly that, whatever else you do isn't going to compensate. Very <laughs> short book. So why is it 200,000 words? Well, the, you know, the other 199,993 words are why it's so hard to perceive that truth. And, and the simple fact is, you know, there's massive profit from pseudo confusion about diet. Big food routinely markets lipstick on a pig. So if the public gets obsessed about gluten, they start churning out gluten-free junk food. Uh, if the public is obsessed about GMOs, they start churning out non-GMO junk food. You know, and, and it's not as if these things don't matter. If you're gluten sensitive, gluten matters. Uh, and sometimes GMO you know, is used to justify spraying Roundup on everything and, and you know, soak the world in glyphosate, not a great thing. Um, but the simple fact is that obsessing about one attribute or one ingredient or one nutrient is missing the forest for the one tree. And you know, there, there are innumerable ways to get diet wrong. And certainly the American public is committed to exploring them all. But big food <laughs> takes full advantage of that and you know, basically says, tell us what your nutrient obsession du jour is. We'll churn out junk food that's right in that one area. It'll be junk food, it's lipstick on a pig, make no mistake, yeah. but you know, you'll buy it. And we'll yeah. laugh about it all the way to the bank. And then I think Big Pharma is perfectly fine with that because essentially, hey, you keep selling them food that makes them fat and sick and profit from that. And we'll sell them drugs they otherwise wouldn't have needed to treat the diseases they never really needed to get. And we can laugh about it together all the way to the bank. Yeah. So, you know, helping people get past all of that, that's the big job. Uh, and and it really, that's that's been the struggle. Uh, and, and quite frankly, the losing struggle of my career uh, you know, I've been at this for 30 years. When I signed up as a newbie, I, I was convinced, you know, I was going to be one of the guys that helped reverse trends in obesity, chronic disease. Well, you know, here it is 30 years later. <laughs> and, you know, we have more obesity than ever. Uh, we have more chronic disease than ever. We're not winning the war. So we have miles to go before we sleep. The, the significance of diet cannot be overstated. I mean, first of all, it's just obvious. It is the fuel that runs everything. You know, these, these incredible machines that are our bodies, every aspect from your immune system to your circulatory system, your liver, your kidneys, your brain, your eyes, I mean, everything, it runs on the fuel you put in your body. The other thing is we are turning over hundreds of millions of cells every day. We are depleting and, and replenishing enzymes. We are depleting and replenishing hormones. The construction material for all of that is food. It's also, by the way, the construction material for the growing body of a child. And, you know, I, I, I've pushed on, on audiences of parents uh, from the very early days of my career, you know, would you willfully build anything that really matters to you, your house, your, your, your car, something you're going to really need to rely on, a suspension bridge you're going to drive over at a junk and just hope for the best? And if the answer is no, would you really sanction building the body of a child you love? out of junk. I mean, the, the, the notion that junk can be a food group is just absurd. Junk is not food. Food is not junk. It is, it is the construction material for the growing body of a child. It is the construction material to replenish everything an adult body uses up. And the evidence fully supports that magnitude of impact. So, you know, again, when I started out in 1993, tobacco was the leading cause of premature death in the developed world. Bad use of feet bad use of force, so lack of physical activity, poor dietary pattern, added up together were number two. Diet is now number one. Poor diet quality is the single leading predictor variable for all-cause mortality. So, you know, if you're going to pick just one thing to fix that would have the greatest impact on health outcomes across the expanse of all the major diseases of modern living, it would clearly be diet. The other reason to focus on diet, Gil, you know, as you know, I've devoted my career preferentially to it even if it wasn't the most important variable, and it now is, and for a number of reasons, not the least of which being everybody eats. Most people do it every day. Uh, you know, it's just, it's an incredibly protean exposure. It's just, you know, it's, it's part of our lives all the time for good or for ill. But the other important thing to me about it is tobacco is a very simple variable. You know, yes is bad, no is good. I mean, you can, you can just avoid it completely. 
physical activity, actually, there, there are subtleties there. But for the most part, as long as you move and get a certain amount of movement into your daily routine, all movement is good movement. And honestly, I don't care whether you walk or bike or hike or run or swim or, you know, it's all good. Diet is an unbelievably complicated variable. Uh, I think it may, in fact, be the single most complicated variable in all of biomedicine because you can't even study isolated aspects of it, really. It, because, if, you know, if you ask people to eat more of A and you don't want them to meet, eat more overall, then inevitably they're going to be eating less of B and you already now two variables are in motion. There's more of A and less of B. And so, you know, if, 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 if A is vegetables and it bumps meat out of the diet, is the benefit from the more vegetables or from the less meat? Is it from both? You know, on and on. It's a really, really difficult thing to study. Uh, we know a lot anyway, um, but we know it despite the fact that it's hard to study. But it is the single most important variable in the health equation in the modern world. It really is. And so, um, you know, I, I, all the rest of the lifestyle medicine formula are very important. And, and all those different elements have their champions who will argue, yeah, diet's important, but. Uh, but epidemiologically, the evidence would say diet is the centerpiece of health, just as it tends to be the centerpiece of everything else, of our tables, of our social gatherings, of our holidays, our celebrations, right? I mean, you know, food is just such a huge part of our lives. So, I mean, Gil and I are sold on that for sure. Um, <laughs> you know, I'm a dietitian. Gil obviously has created Inside Tracker. I think something you said earlier really resonated with me that, you know, doctors are putting Humpty Dumpty back together, but they're not preventing him from falling off the wall. Um, I love that you have a nutrition textbook that's out there for people in medical school, but whose responsibility is it to give this information, the right information on diet out there? And why is it something that is so different, difficult? Like how, how do we combat all of the conflicting advice that's, that's out there? You know, I only see people when they're either being very proactive or I'm their last resort. There's nothing right. kind of in between. So how do we get there? Yes, yeah, so there's a lot to unpack there, Ashley. Good, good multi-component question. So I, I would argue, <clears throat> just as I think health professionals, all health professionals, physicians included, but certainly not just physicians, are duty bound to talk about the health of the planet now. It's in peril. It's vitally, you can't be healthy without a healthy planet, so it becomes part of your professional purview. Similarly, if diet is the single leading predictor variable for all-cause mortality, total chronic disease, and as a physician, you're supposed to be combating bad stuff happening to people and your patients, you've got to talk about diet. Got to. It's an obligation. And so we need to empower physicians. First of all, we need to mandate that. So, you know, the professional societies need to start leaning on docs and saying that this is not optional anymore. This is an obligation. If, if you're not addressing diet, if you're not assessing diet, you're falling short of professional standards. Medicine is pretty hidebound. Um, you know, it's very quick to take up new drugs and new technologies, but it's very slow to change the workflow. The, the stuff mm -hmm. that doctors do in the room, very slow to change, incredibly difficult to change. Uh, and trying to get docs to change on masses is, is literally like herding cats. Uh, so, you know, you, you need a whole sequence of interventions. You need educational material. You need CME. Docs all have to get a certain amount of continuing medical education credit every year to renew their licenses. So training in nutrition needs to be CME authorized. We actually need requirements that a certain volume of the CME credit needs to be in nutrition because you, we all know you haven't been trained in it. It's time to get educated. We need new tools. We need new tools that can empower clinicians and patients with information about what diet is, what diet's doing, what diet ought to be. Inside Tracker is an example. So is Diet ID. So, you know, again, we're, we can integrate into EHRs. We can make diet a vital sign. 60 seconds is all we need to provide comprehensive information about diet. That's not going to make every physician expert, but frankly, every physician's not expert in managing hypertension either. But every physician needs to know my patient has high blood pressure and either I'm comfortable managing it or I need to refer to a cardiologist or a nephrologist. Similarly, okay, I may not feel expert at managing diet, but this I can see objectively my patient's diet quality is poor. They're eating too much of this, too little of that. I need a dietitian consult. I, I need help. This, you know, it's broken. It needs to be fixed. I, you know, th that would be a good place to start. So I think there are lots and lots of things we can do in the clinical setting. We new, need new educational innovations, and we have them. Culinary medicine. You know, I mean, back when I went to medical school, they taught us biochemistry and said they've all learned nutrition. 
And, and now we realize how absurd that is. You know, which part of biochemistry can you talk to a patient about and help them have a better dinner? Uh, none. Uh, but if you know a good recipe that you've actually prepared yourself and it's quick and it's easy and it's delicious and it's nutritious and here's the recipe card, you know, that's a different kind of conversation. Well, that's what medical schools are doing now, culinary medicine. Med students are being taught how to cook and then asked to pay it forward. You know, that, that's a great innovation. Many people involved uh, in that, but um, a shout out to my friend at Harvard, Dr. David Eisenberg, who's been in the vanguard of that effort among others. Uh, but you know, I think that's really, really important. So new educational paradigms, a greater professional obligation. But then at the end of all this, let's look again at the blue zones and let's acknowledge the fact that where people eat well at scale it's not because their doctors or dietitians are doing such a swell job counseling them. It's because it's normal to eat well. It's because their population does not run on Dunkin'. Mm -hmm. It's because multicolored marshmallows are not part of every child's complete breakfast. It's because Coke and Pepsi are not the national approach to hydration. You know, I mean, it's, it's culturally normal to drink water. It's culturally normal to eat real food and actually have a garden and grow stuff you eat yourself. And, you know, so, Ultimately, if lifestyle is the best medicine, culture is the big spoon that mm -hmm. delivers that medicine and gets it to go down. Clinics, I think, everything about clinical medicine should be in the vanguard of leading the cultural revolution. All health professionals should be advocating for this change, acknowledging how important diet is. But I think it would be perfectly reasonable for, for every physician, for example, to say, look, I'm not an expert in nutrition. I know how important it is. I, we're going to assess your diet. We're going to track your diet. If we need extra help to improve your diet via an app or a digital program or a referral to a dietitian or all of the above or health coaching or, you know, we'll, 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 we'll do that. But I also want you to know, I don't think it should be this hard to eat well. I don't think it's right that, you know, our food supply is mostly made up of junk. Uh, I don't think it's right that we feed, you know, things to our kids that if you fed to an animal in a zoo, you'd be arrested. You know, it would be an act of vandalism. I mean, if you gave this to a dolphin, I mean, really, the police would cart you away. You can't. I mean, this glow in the dark Franken food that we feed our kids. You know, so I think every physician can kind of just just be woke on this topic and then and pass that along and say it's just wrong. Junk is not food. Food is not junk. What we feed our kids, what grows their body, really matters. That's I, I you know I think that is the the initial vibration of a tectonic shift. I think that's that's the initial murmuring of a cultural revolution. And then, you know, yeah, let's be a blue zone. And in a blue zone, it's not willpower. And it isn't even skill power at the individual level that enables people to eat well. It's an environment, a social environment, where eating well is normal. Everybody does it because everybody does it. There really isn't much of an alternative. Ultimately, we want to get there. Clinics have a role to play but we do need a cultural revolution. So, so David, do you see a, a world that uh, uh, when you go to McDonald's, you pay a tax because it's not healthy and uh, basically it's become very expensive and not uh, uh, not reasonably uh, uh, cheap or uh, the best of, uh, option for you? You know, Gil, you, you've probably heard me say this before. I, I, I'm an actual equestrian. I have a horse. And, you know, the expression carrots and sticks comes from the world of, of equestrianism. And, you know, horses love carrots. They do not like the stick. And so when I'm riding Troubadour, I always reward him with carrots. I, I try not to wield the stick. Every now and then he forces me to do it. But, you know, I, I'm, very, I'm very light with the stick. And I'm very generous with the carrots. I feel the same way about people. You know, I mean, if we can do it with carrots rather than sticks, let's. Um, so, you know, I think incentives for nutrition nutritious food. Um, I mean, there are all sorts of ways to do this. Uh, you know, in, in programs like SNAP, uh, food stamp program, you know, we, we could create guidance systems for people in the SNAP program to identify more nutritious foods in every category, attach financial incentives, and then that money rolls over into a savings account, which can be spent on not anything, can't be spent on tobacco, cannot be spent on Doritos, but can be spent on gym membership, clothes, mm -hmm. college tuition, you know, all, all the all the stuff, uh, mortgage, rent, uh, utilities, you know, all the stuff that people really need and really want. Um, so I think we could address it there. I think we could bake similar systems into private insurance in the United States. Um, I think employers can make better use of behavioral economics in this space. So I think a lot of it can be on the incentive side. But I do think there's a role for taxes at the corporate level for the production of foods that essentially prey on the public health 
and frankly, exact a high planetary cost as well. So, you know, every metric you look at related to planetary impact, beef is off the charts, literally off the charts. And, and the conclusion of every scholarly effort to address this um, has been, you know, humanity has to eat a whole lot less meat if we want to stick around. The, the, the seminal Eat Lancet Commission report on food, planet, people, um, basically 90% reduction of, of global meat consumption is recommended if we want to stay within sustainable boundaries. Well, that's, that's a big drop. It's going to be easier and easier for people to do that because of, you know, the alternatives to meat beyond impossible, all those innovations. So even people who have a carnivorous palate can have their meat and eat it too, as it were, or have their meat and not eat it too, um, you know, and save the planet. But yeah, I, I, so I don't know that I like the idea of, you know, taxing a food choice, you know, at, at the level of the consumer. But I think you could tax food production that is actually costing all of us the quality of our air, the preservation of our aquifers, the preservation of the Amazon rainforest, biodiversity, uh, sustainable food production so our kids have something to eat too when we're done. Um, and for that matter, you know, I'm selling a product that we know contributes to obesity, diabetes, heart disease, cancer, stroke, dementia, uh, and excise tax seems a reasonable thing to do. So I would say let's mostly give carrots to the people and, and you know, empower them to make the better choice and then give them rewards for making the better choice. And, and you know, again, I, that's a reward that extends to others. I mean, if employers do that, it's not pure altruism. A healthier workforce means more productivity, lower costs. It's not altruism on the part of an insurer because you know you can pay now or you can pay later you can provide the carrots at the front and carrots are inexpensive or you can wait for these people to need coronary bypass and dialysis and pay for that that's really expensive so yeah. this is a, a scenario where everybody can win the payers can spend less on incentivizing healthy choices than they're currently spending on treating disease the individuals can avoid the disease and live a more vital life and you know if we do this at the federal level taxpayers benefit because they're actually seeing we are actually seeing our money spent well rather than badly for a change. So, you know, again, I, I would favor carrots all around, selective use of, of taxes, um, uh, excise taxes in particular. So, you know, essentially apply the stick where there's already massive profit, which you could argue really is predatory profiteering. We know we're doing harm to the planet. We know we're doing harm to public health but it's making us really rich and we don't give a damn. Well, I, you know, that's the place to slap a tax. Makes yeah. sense. It does seem a lot of just equal presentation of medication versus all of the other things in this bucket that you can do. If there was an apple and like a hiking commercial for every processed food commercial you saw on TV, people would be able to see them a lot more too. Um, I, are there is there a specific kind of myth or fad out there today that you feel like is having a really significant impact on health and longevity in the U.S. in particular? Yeah, I mean, if the, the single biggest fad. Uh, my my most recent book was one I did with Mark Bittman, uh, How to Eat, and we 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 you know we had actually been looking forward to doing all sorts of interviews, partly because Mark's famous. So I was going to ride his coattails. We were scheduled <laughs> to do the Today Show, and you know all the good stuff. And then, then the pandemic hit and nobody was doing anything. And so, oops. But we, we did manage to, to schedule a couple of interviews. We did one with an NPR station. And I think their last question to us was, you know, so what's the single most important news about diet? And, you know, I looked at Mark, Mark looked at me, we shrugged our shoulders. I answered, and I said that there is no news about diet. <laughs> that's, you know, so that's the biggest myth that, that, that we need to be learning something fundamentally new about diet and lifestyle in order to be healthy, that we're waiting for the answer. That's the biggest myth. Mm. Tune in tomorrow to find out the really right way to eat because everything you knew until this morning is wrong. And we're going to bring on a guest to tell you, don't listen to all those guys. They're morons. Listen to me now. I'm the only one who knows and is willing to tell you the truth. And I mean, there's an endless parade of that nonsense. I'm the Messiah. Just listen to me. Oh, yeah. don't listen to those other guys. Nah, they're all wrong. No, vegetables are actually bad for you. <laughs> it seems like they're good for you. I know, but you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to set the record straight. So, you know, again, the blue zones, uh, they're not waiting for the morning show to tell them how to eat. They eat like their great grandparents ate and everybody does great. Mm -hmm. There is no news. I mean, sure, we, there's a lot to learn. There are a lot of details we don't know. We're going to learn tremendous things about mechanistic pathways and, and we're going to learn all kinds of new things about the how. 
innovations, technological innovations, applications of artificial intelligence, machine learning to empower people to get there from here. All of that's new, but the what, you know, where there is that you really ought to eat mostly, read my lips, <laughs> unprocessed vegetables, fruits, whole grains, beans, lentils, nuts, and seeds, and drink plain water when thirsty. It doesn't matter how many times you ask me, I'll tell you again. <laughs> like Dory in Finding Nemo, I'll tell you again. <laughs> Lee Sherman. Yeah, so fruits, vegetables, whole grains, beans, lentils, nuts, and seeds, plain water when thirsty. I mean, you know, it's just, there is no news. There isn't gonna be any news. That's not going to change. It really is not. So people are waiting for that to change and acting as if, well, since we don't really know yet, I can keep going to Burger King until we figure it out. <laughs> Ask the French fries, you know? And, and so, I mean, there's sort of a collusion there because big media invites people to pretend like we don't know, because if we don't know, you've got to tune in tomorrow to find out. And people sort of look at all of that competing information and say, I guess we really don't know, so I don't really know, so I don't have to do what we kind of know, so I can keep doing what I feel like doing, which is bring on the hamburgers, french fries, and Coca-Cola, thank you very much. So that's, that's the biggest myth of all, is that we're waiting for news. We're not waiting for news. We're waiting to use what we have long known. That's great. Thank you for that. The news is there is no news. <laughs> Uh, let's see. Is there any um, other than diet ID, which I think it, what you said before, making diet a vital sign that yeah, you well, have just, to check is great. Yeah. So just quickly, you know, I, I'm really proud of it, excited about it. Uh, I think it's relevant to this conversation. I, you know, I think there are all sorts of opportunities to collaborate um, throughout the world of digital innovation because we've sort of designed this to be the chip inside. You know, we, we look to others like Insight Tracker to build, you know, an, an elaborate machine. And we've, we've just fixed one piece, but it's a critically important piece. So rather than ask people to remember all the different foods they've eaten for the last three months, badly, because people are really bad at remembering details, or to lie about what they ate yesterday. <laughs> so I mean, we've, got, we've got semi quantitative food frequency questions, which take 90 minutes for people to misremember what and how much they ate over the past three months. Or they can, you know, it just so happens that yesterday was my best day of eating ever. So I'll describe that to you, right? That inevitably you do a 24 hour recall. Yeah. Well, yesterday, yesterday was not typical. You know? <laughs> uh, I just ate a whole lot of kale yesterday, uh, as fate would have it. Uh, so we, we've said, look, people are really bad at, at remembering details, but they're really good at pattern recognition. That's a survival trait. Malcolm Gladwell described that beautifully in Blink, you know, just that power of looking at something and having a kind of a visceral reaction, knowing what's what. So we use that to inform dietary assessments. So we built a comprehensive map of real world diets stratified by type and quality, populated that map. Every cell in that map has an image. I'll spare you the details, it would take too long but teams of dietitians put together the meal plans that translate into those images. But we show you two images at a time and ask you which of these looks more like stuff you eat A or B. And you say B, we say, how about now? You say A, we say, how about now? You say B, we say, how about now? You say B. It's like an eye test. You know, you go to the eye doctor, you look at two images, which is in focus. And in 30 seconds, you've got a perfect prescription for your eyes and diopters. So in 60 seconds, we've got your diet in units of the Healthy Eating Index 2015. And we can report out diet type, diet quality objectively measured, estimates of 150 nutrient intake levels, and on and on it goes in 60 seconds. And it's even fun. You know, you're not struggling to remember, okay, when I ate pasta uh, <laughs> eight weeks ago, what was my sauce and how much of that? And, you know, you, none of that. Just, yeah, A, B, B, A. You know, it's just, it's easy. It's fun. It's like a game. Uh, and it works. We validated against both the FFQ and 24-hour recall. So we're on a mission to make diet the vital sign it deserves to be. That's uh, really cool. So, David, where, where do you see the field of public health in the next five to 10 years? So what about the field of uh, nutrition and longevity? So, uh, you know, again, I, I think the, there's tremendous advance, most of which I don't understand in the area of artificial intelligence, machine learning. So, you know, I mean, what I understand is, you know, we have an incredible new opportunity to look at actual outcome patterns in large numbers of people. And aggregate that information into actionable innovation you know so essentially you know we identified that when somebody's got a b c j and l that the best intervention is number three and you know i mean that's stuff that you, you need large numbers of people you, you need to be able to analyze many cells 
and you need to make sense out of a vast flow of data. And we now have the capacity to do that. So there's no question that digital therapeutics will, will completely transform public health and its contributions to longevity and will in many areas critically personalize the journey because a lot of the information flowing in so that, you know, really AI and machine learning are all about big data, but it's taking big data from populations and converting that into something that's incredibly intimate. So, you know, basically we, we've looked at your pattern against the big data. The guidance is about you. And, you know, I, I, people like that. It's, it's one of the hot consumer trends, personalize everything. You know, I, I don't want generic advice. I want it to be about me. But it, it's also genuinely empowering because, you know, when you use GPS, you don't want it to tell you how to get somewhere. You want it to tell you how to get where you actually want to go. I mean, I think that's the way health is. Health is a journey. And I think the ability to empower people on their personal journey is transformational. So digital therapeutics will be a huge part of the, the transformation. I think the confluence of the health of people, health of the planet has got to be a critical theme. So we, you know, we, we actually need to append that question to everything. What is a healthy diet that's good for the planet? You know, the paleo diet's interesting in that context. You know, maybe it would be good for all of us to eat game, you know, venison or antelope. But there aren't enough venison, uh, there aren't enough deer or antelope left playing on the planet for 8 billion hungry homo sapiens to eat them. So it's moot, uh, you know, and we can't substitute domestic meat because we're killing the planet. There was, there was a piece just recently in the Atlantic, your diet is cooking the planet. And, you know, it's just, it, it's translating into pop culture. That's a theme that's here to stay because, I mean, this is the signature moment of our time. We have to think beyond the bounds of our own skin. So, you know, frankly, I think, advice, guidance, innovation, intervention that addresses the confluence of what's good for you and good for the planet will be increasingly important. That, that's, that's a great passion of mine. And then the other thing, Gil, you know, this is sort of big picture issue, but, you know, in the United States, we have this incredibly complex and frankly, quite cockamamie system of what we call healthcare, which is really just disease care and the way we reimburse it and all that. But we need to transform all of that. So, you know, if we want to talk about disease prevention, health promotion, wellness, vitality, longevity, we don't have a system designed to deal with that. We have a system designed to diagnose disease and prescribe drugs and surgery. So, you know, essentially, if, if we are going to foster a cultural revolution about building health at its origins and not just being the king's horses and the king's men, then, you know, we need to think about what we currently call the healthcare system and what really is a disease care system Think about it diversifying its portfolio. So, you know, you can go to war with big oil or you can invite big oil to start investing in, in wind and solar, <laughs> you know, and I, I think the latter's better. You know, they have huge resources. They could be a major force for good change. And if you fight them, it's going to slow down progress we all need. So instead, you know, let, let's create opportunity for them to shift their portfolio from burning fossil fuel to generating clean energy. Similarly, in the so-called healthcare space, I think enlightened organizations now should be investing in fitness chains. I think they should start to be investing in restaurants and kiosks and vending machines that dispense healthy options. And, and I think ultimately hospitals should have many fewer beds and should own restaurants and gyms. And actually, you know, essentially the third party payers are paying the healthcare system to do what the healthcare system doesn't currently do. And that is make health keep people healthy. You know, so I think all the incentives can change. I, I, I wrote a piece for Forbes a couple of years ago um, from disease care to healthcare, monetizing the revolution. It was about this. And, and it's a long time horizon. You know, we have to get there incrementally. I don't see hospital beds going away in a year or five or 10, but in 30, you know, ha having 80% fewer hospital beds, we would still need surge capacity for eventualities, like, you know, black swan events like a pandemic, for example. But, you know, in general, we could operate 80% fewer hospital beds and a whole lot more gyms. And everybody gets a financial incentive. Your gym membership's free because third-party payers cover that. Because mm -hmm. frankly, you know, paying for you to go to the gym is a heck of a lot better than paying for you to have bariatric surgery. You know, you're healthier. You're more vital. I get more out of you. My business thrives. It's less expense. I mean, everybody wins. But we have to imagine the sequence of transformational events that take us from a disease care system where we pay ex post facto to partly fix what's badly broken and will never be whole again to a system where we're actually investing in vitality at its origins and everybody winds up better off. 
Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. That's great. All right, so last question from us, and you've mentioned it a few times, so I'm gonna give you another opportunity to say it. But if there's one decision that you intentionally make every single day that you know is based on living longer, um, but also having more life in those years, um, what would, or what could you share with our listeners? Maybe one tip that they could take and apply right away. A decision that I make every day. You know, I, I practice what I preach. And so I don't think there's much for me to say here about eating well. It, it's hardly a decision anymore. You know, it's just, it's all I know. It's all I've done for so long. Um, maybe the same is true about physical activity. I've exercised every day. I, I think probably the, the, the decision that I make, because this is the hard one for me, is just to, to appreciate the moment I'm in, whether that's hugging my wife or if I'm out hiking with my dogs, just thinking, what a privilege it is to be, you know, I, I love these creatures and, and to have them with me and be with them and be in the woods. Um, I have a horse, as I mentioned, riding, I, you know, that's meditation for me. I, I've tried meditating, by the way. And, you know, my meditation is how many emails could I be answering now? How many? <laughs> I, I, just, I just can't do it. I'm sorry, Deepak. I just can't do it. Um, so for me, you know, I need to be doing something active. So it's a hike or it's, you know, horseback and uh, and that really works for me. So I, I think it is just recognizing the importance of that today. Because, uh, you know, when you're really busy or a bit, you see so many things wrong in the world and you want to want to help fix them. Uh, and in particular, when, as I mentioned, we're still lo losing the war. So we've got miles to go. You know, it can be exhausting. I know a lot of, you know, champions of health who are killing themselves <laughs> to promote health. There's something oxymoronic about that. <laughs> So I think the decision I make every day is, yeah, I, I want to continue to be part of the remedy for, for all that's wrong. Um, but I want to, I want to celebrate um, the privileges in my life. Uh, my beautiful wife, uh, I have people who love me, uh, that, that I, you know, I, I have the opportunity to get out in nature. I can ride my horse, hike with my dogs. I, I'm conscious. I don't know if it's a decision so much, but the thing that I, I force myself to be conscious about is that these opportunities are beautiful things celebrate them right now. You know, I don't know what tomorrow's gonna bring, but I can celebrate this today. Thank you for that. I think that's a good reminder for all of us. Um, Gil and I probably could sit here and talk to you for a few more hours, but we have <laughs> taken up a lot of your time. Thank you so, so much for joining us, um, for being here today. It was an awesome conversation. Thank you. A pleasure to be with both of you. Thank you so much, David. Pleasure, and Gil. And we look forward to exploring the research in the field of longevity each week with more of the leading scientists in the field and with all of you. Thanks for joining us.